Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. This is show 747 this week in WordPress and SaaS. Got a special guest, a returning guest, a friend, um, somebody I look up to, somebody that can deal with my madness, deals with a lot of people's madness, uh, uh, always reasonably calm. We've got Rob Rowley back again. Uh, um, thanks so much, Rob, for agreeing to come back on the show. In this show, we're going to be talking about the AI robots. They're coming for us all, the developers, the writers, the designers. They're coming for us all, folks. But in this madness, in this period of disruption, there probably are opportunities. And I'm going to be seeing if Rob's got some views on this. I'm sure he has. So, Rob... Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Hey, listeners and viewers. Nice to see you. I'm Rob Walling. I have started, um, I was trying to count the other day. I kind of say six companies, serial entrepreneur. I've had a couple exits uh, in SaaS, but I've been doing it since back before SaaS when it was downloadable software. Um, and these days I run MicroConf, which is the largest community for non-venture track SaaS founders, bootstrapped and mostly bootstrapped. And we have an online community in-person events. And I run Tiny Seed, which is the first startup accelerator for SaaS bootstrappers. And we've funded 105 companies in the past three and a half years. And we have a $40 million, $40 million in funding that we raised to invest in bootstrap and mostly bootstrap SaaS founders. And then I have a podcast called Startups for the Rest of Us, which I always think it's, I think it's pretty cool that I have like 650 episodes. I, there are very, very few podcasts that have more episodes than I. So 747, bravo to you, sir. That's that's a real yeah, milestone. It's, it's more bonkers than that, Rob. Nice. I, I, I do another podcast that's up to 400. Unbelievable. In, in my, I've got two businesses, Rob. Yep. And then I, I started a new podcast, The Membership Machine Show. And we're already up to episode 14. Uh, Rob, so I'm bonkers. Well, you know I'm bonkers. Mm -hmm. and I, uh, um. His wife knows as well. They're, they're very charitable to me because they both know I'm bonkers. At least I know I'm bonkers, Rob. It's when you don't. Uh, um, I've got my co got my co-host with us. Kirk, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Kurt, Kurt Von Annen. I own an agency called Manana Nomas. I focus largely on membership and e-learning type websites. And uh, I'm thrilled to meet Rob. I used to listen to startups for the rest of us way back. And when I saw the notes... That's not the right thing to say, Kirk. You should be saying that you, you're an avid listener. You're still listening. Now. <laughs> no, that's, it was like a reminder. I was like, ah! Yeah, right? So it's like, it's like, there it is. So I was like super stoked. Right. Very cool. Good there to meet go. you. Right, before we go into the main part of this great interview, I'm really looking forward. It's always fantastic to talk to Rob. Um, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. Back. Just want to point out, if you're looking for a great hosting provider, a great WordPress partner, if you're building a learning management system for a client or a buddy boss website, or combination, why don't you look at utilizing WP Tonic as your partner? You can earn a great initial commission and then ongoing um, commission afterwards. And we deal with all the headaches, provide all the technology and consultation. It's a great partnership. If that's interesting, go over to WP Tonic slash partners, WP Tonic slash partners, and learn some more. So let's go straight into it, Rob. Um, so apart from AI, oh, I suppose it's all going to be AI, um, is there anything that's come on your radar in the bootstrap community in 2022 that you like to share with the audience and viewers? Yeah, sure. There's a few things I've I've been noticing. And I actually asked some folks on my team, I was like, help me, let me flesh this out. Because I said, AI is too obvious, right? Everyone already knows that. I think there's three things and I can run through them quickly. Two that I think are more interesting than, than the third. But um, the first thing is no code is becoming a real thing. No code and low code. And this has been a movement that started many years ago. But people are building more and more with this. Um, even at MicroConf Tiny Seed, we have now three or four basically full-blown SaaS apps that are all built on Airtable, Bubble, Softer, or Softer, one of those three. Um, 
And it's pretty incredible that it's an internal, their internal line of business apps. It's like podcast production or video production for our YouTube channel. It's all strongly typed workflow management for us. And if we didn't have those, we would, we were doing it like in Notion. And before that we were doing it uh, essentially with Trello plus a Google doc, you know, so we've slowly just gotten better and better. There are also people now building MVPs with no code and getting to the point where, oh, now I have three, four, 5,000 in MRR. Now I'm going to go code it because I validated it. And then there are people, uh, there is, I forget the name of the app, but there is a guy with an app in the Shopify app store that is a production app that they're using. And it was built with Bubble. And he's he told us uh, his revenue privately. I can't disclose it, but it's a nice little side income that he didn't have to write code for. So there aren't a ton of full-blown, there aren't any full-blown SaaS apps, right? Like you can't build Drip, uh, an email service provider. You couldn't build, you know, Signwell, which is like... Uh, electronic signature, like those are too big, too, they need too much scale, whatever, but you can get these step one businesses, these are early stage businesses, no code, low code. That's the first one. Uh, the second one is the build in public movement. You know how that's you, that's been something for years of like- Well, I lived uh, my whole life in public. Transparency. I'm always, I'm always, I'm always doing a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> so, and that's the thing, right? Like when we started Startups to the Rest of Us 13 years ago, part of that, big part of that was building in public. Um, but the movement and the sharing, the transparency of revenue and the transparency of all this, your internal documents and salaries and all that, like Buffer has done, that seems to be cooling off. There are a lot more people that are just taking down their public revenue uh, dashboards. And there are still some people doing it, but it is, it is less trendy, I'll say, um, less popular, fewer people doing it. And the, the third one, which kind of tacks onto that, is there was a big push of indie founder podcasts where two, two developers would get together and they'd start a podcast and just talk about what was going on every week. That kind of crested and the 70% of those are either on sporadic schedules now or have completely stopped producing. So those are three trends. Do you have any thoughts about the third one, why that's happened? I don't know. Well, I, here's why it happens. Because two people sharing their journey, their entrepreneurial journey on a microphone is, is a very hard format. It works for a month or two, and then you just don't have anything interesting to say. I've done it. I was in that exact yeah, you did that drip. I, I thought that was fabulous. Well, it was more about your suffering. I, in the end, exactly. I, felt, I felt sorry for you, even though you made a ton of money from it, but it was such a painful journey. I it was tell it was tough. And that, But see, those were the best years of the of our podcast, but there was a huge lull in there for like two years where you were just kind of, you're kind of straining for content. It's like, well, nothing good, nothing interesting happened in the last week. I don't know what to tell you, you know, and because that's the journey, right? The part of the journey is a lot of boredom. And then part of the journey is a lot of stuff you can't say on a microphone at the time. And so what happens is people start the podcast. It's super interesting for a month or two as you learn them and then, and then it gets old and then you get to 500 or a thousand listeners and you realize, is this worth the time? You know, I think that the people start questioning the value of, of that. So I like those podcasts, but also I tend to listen for a few months and then I wind up unsubscribing because it just isn't that interesting in the long term. You have to have some other, um, some other thing, whether it's guests like you do, whether it is, yeah, yeah, I do all types of crazy format. I do listener question episodes. I do solo episodes, which yeah. are kind of like think pieces. You know, I think once you start mixing up formats, you can, you can have longevity. And the second one, I always had mixed feelings about that because I'm English at heart. Um, I believe in openness and a, a flat hierarchy. Um, but on the other hand, I found it a bit queasy publishing everything. You know, I think some things, I think some things are private. You know, you know, if you want to share it with colleagues or friends, that should be you. But I think. It must be my English side of me. I just find it a bit crazy. Everybody wants to know everybody else's business. Yeah. I So I always viewed it as, so there, I should separate. There's build in public, like you're saying, you know, you talk on a podcast, I talk on a podcast. Then there is this transparency of like, I'm going to be transparent with all these internal numbers. That's never anything that I did. I would do just in time transparency where I, if I was doing a microconf talk, I would say, this is our MRR because it helps set context for this. But then that talk wouldn't go on YouTube for six months. And that felt okay to me, but I did not have a live dashboard, nor did I publish salaries. It felt um, to me, I didn't, I didn't like the idea of it. Some people call it 
instead of building in public, call it bragging in public, because that's how it comes across from some people. Yeah. They do a year interview and be like, look at all the money I made. Aren't I the coolest? And it's like, yeah, that's a little annoying. Look at all the ratings. Of, sorry, ratings, yeah. English slang term. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Well, and the other thing is the bother, that has always bothered me about it is almost all the people who do it, they claim, oh, I'm doing this to help other entrepreneurs. They're not. They're doing it to brag, or they're transparent only about the good stuff. There's only the only person I know who's transparent about both is Rand Fishkin. He is yeah, super he, transparent, he and then he's super transparent. To a level, about, to a level, yep. I find, I find, I would say intimidating. It's just something. It's, it's to a level that kind of super impressive. Uh, yep, impressive. But, I, I just would, I would even do it. Mm -mm. I wouldn't either, but that's that's his personality and he's comfortable yeah. with it, right? But then a lot of the others, I don't want to name names, but kind of everyone else, all the transparency is like, look how transparent I'm being. We are killing it. It's 5 million ARR and you know, uh, we got this huge deal. But then when, when things go sideways and they're plateauing and you can see it in their public revenue, they're not blogging about that. There's no blog post coming out about, wow, it's really hard right now, right? It's only the good things. And that always bothered me because it's like, that's not being transparent. That's just being braggy when things are going well. So that's my personal opinion. I also think the folks, I mean, Josh Pigford of Bear Metrics talked about his transparency and how it came back to bite him later because people started copying him. And that is a, a big issue, right? The more you disclose, the more likely someone jumps in and, and copies what you're doing. Well, over to you, Kurt. I know that Jonathan wanted to talk about AI and we were having, um, listening to you talk about your, your three items there and the lack of um, creativity and podcasts and ideas and stuff. I wonder what your thoughts are on just the, kind of the natural flow of AI and how that might extend ideas and concepts and, and give people that, that starter seed to help those things be more successful. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm surprised, you know, like anything, AI is part hype, like the chat GPT, let's just say that. That's that's the biggest thing. I think the most uh, tangible thing that we can talk about. And some people don't see the benefit of it. And then I have a project manager who's helping me with my my new book um, that's I'm going to kickstart in a couple months. She uses it every day. Every day we talk and she's like, oh, I asked chat GPT this. And then I refined it. And I'm like, this is game changing. And I've already asked it to like, I'm, I have to record a YouTube video on sales, SaaS, sales and marketing metrics. And I, why not go to chat GPT and say, outline a video on this topic. And then I can look through and usually I kill half of what it puts out, but it's a nice seed for me to, um, to your point. I have a bunch of stuff in my head of what sales and marketing video would, you know, what it would have in it. Chat GPT always under something that I didn't think of, but I'm like, that's actually a really good point. And I wind up including it. Yeah, I put it off and put it off and put it off myself. But then I gave it that first try. And then I was like, oh, that really saved me a lot of time. Yeah. And then I started using it more like with other tools, like what are people asking and how can I find that answer? And then how can I, as a writer, embellish that answer or give it my own flavor? And right. I found it to be a really good tool. Yeah. But when I think about how it might affect, you know, affecting the bootstrap startup community or giving people ideas or helping people extend um, their efforts, I was wondering if you if you thought that that might positively or maybe negatively affect, you know, the 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 bootstrap SaaS community. I feel like, I mean, there's a there's a number of angles there, right? One is, I think over the next couple of years. Um, more and more tools, like we see Notion now has the AI, like you can put a podcast transcript, for example, and it'll summarize the podcast or Intercom just launched yesterday, last couple of days where they have all this AI built in to, for responses. I mean, that's amazing, right? That's going to impact and become, that's going to become easier, but from a product perspective, of course, that's going to be integrated into more and more things. So that's one angle. Another angle is in, you know, think about marketing. And either there are a lot of founders I know, it's like a two founder team, and one of them is trying to crank out blog posts. Well, now that's that's a seed, right? You can either say outline this. I mean, with copy.ai, jasper.ai, where there it's a full blown, yeah. you know, chat GPT is not for blog posts, right? It's just for short form things. The responses are limited. But uh, so it, it's actually, I think, a benefit to help someone especially someone who cares, who's not just going to use the whole AI generated thing, but like you and I just said, it's a seed that you then improve upon. So I think it makes bootstrap founders more efficient in terms of marketing, SEO, and content. Um, and then, you know, another aspect of course is code. And even some really good senior developers I know are getting in there and saying, 
build me this thing, you know, based on build me a calculator based on blah, blah, blah. And if you're a good developer, again, you look at it and you say, oh, it didn't do that right. So I'm going to spend 20% of the time that I would have spent writing it from scratch to fix that, you know, and then, and then I'm in. So, and there are even more angles in the interest of time, I won't do it, but you know, I won't go into it, but uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of impact. What I have been trouble, I've been having trouble thinking of is what are the potential negative? Cause the three I just mentioned are all positive. I don't know off the top of my head. I'd be curious to hear from either of you. Like, do you see negative aside from, look, if you're a shitty writer, yeah, you're, you're not going to have a job, <laughs> right? Because it, it's going to write better than you. Uh, if you're a crappy developer, it's going to develop better than you. But I think the net, I think, I think of a lot of net positives for bootstrappers. I don't know that I can think uh, offhand of a, a big negative impact. Curious if you guys do. Well, um, yeah. in the bootstrap, well, it's probably going to, you're going to be busy. Tiny Seed's going to be busy for the next few years. Uh, um, society, well, there was This Week in Startups um, pointed out that Amazon Square, the stadium, they were utilising AI to identify people's faces and any people that said nasty things about Amazon Stadium on Twitter or social media, or the, they would, they would... <laughs> They were kicking them out. <laughs> right, or people, security would talk to them. But that's fine. Like, they, I can think of a lot of negative stuff in the society as a whole. But for bootstrappers, I don't know. Haven't thought of any yet. I'm sure we'll see some. Yeah. The, the one negative that came to my mind, Rob, was the idea that it gives it can give certain people that aren't at that 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 level yet. They're still, you know, they're not the diamond in the rough yet. They're still the charcoal, right? Mm. And it's like might give them that that piece of um, security or inspiration to take the next step into bootstrapping before they're ready, like false confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's where I thought that, that might be a negative because if we flood the market with people that aren't ready to be in the market, it kind of dissolves it or dilutes it for the rest of the people that are prepared. I can see that. Yep, that's one. And as you were talking, I realized for bootstrappers, but for anyone who's hiring now, people can fake it. Like, what if I'm not a good writer and I give you a bunch of AI writing, right? And that is, so that could potentially be a negative or code for that matter. Give me some code yeah. samples. To do. Like what, I sent a code project out, right? We used to give projects and now people could go to co uh, Copilot. Is that GitHub's yeah. or, or chat GPT to, to do it? So that means we have to get a little more creative, right? I, I know that OpenAI released a AI content um, identifier, right? It's not great yeah. yet, right? They said there's a bunch of false positives, but it'll be within six months. That, that'll be an amazing resource. And then I think for, if you're hiring developers, we had actually years ago switched from take home projects to pair programming. And if you do that, then you're, you know, you actually watch them code the thing. So there, there are ways around it. It's just, we have to get a little more creative. Cool. Yeah. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks for that, Kirk. We're going to go for our middle break. It's been a fantastic discussion already. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. I'm back, folks. Just want to point out, we've got some fantastic um, deals um, on the WP Tonic site around our sponsors, plus a curated list of the best plugins and WordPress services. You can get all these goodies by going over to WPTonic slash deals, WPTonic slash deals. And you can sign up for the weekly WPTonic newsletter, which I write with the help of AI. But it's me, it's me at the core. You can tell by the terrible English jokes. So um, on to the next question. I'm doing well. I even get a smile for Rob. So there we go. Uh, um, so, uh, sorry, Rob. Uh, um, do you can, so on to the next week. Um, so do you think, 
over the last 18 months, do you think it's got easier for a bootstrap SaaS to get to this unical, mystical level 10,000 income per month? Or do you actually think it's getting harder, Rob? I love that in bootstrapping, we use unicorn to mean 10,000 a month because in the rest of the world, it's a billion dollar company. But <laughs> uh, uh... I, well, we're, so in the, we're in the real world here. Yeah, yeah, the... exactly. <laughs> I think, so over the long term, like I think 10, 15 years ago uh, versus today, I think it's easier today. And there's more competition, but there is so much more, there's more information out there. And there are these massive ecosystems that you can build into like the Shopify app store, Heroku app store, uh, WordPress plugin repository. You know, you can build these add-ons to an existing ecosystem and getting to 10K with one, two, three of those mm -hmm. is much, much easier than it was building. Because you had, to, let's say 10, 15 years ago, you had to build standalone software and that is a lot harder. So I have a thing called the stair-step approach, stair-step method of bootstrapping, which talks about that. And there's actually a guy at rocketgems.com who's put together a list of 69 different software app store marketplaces like I'm talking about that you can build add-ons to. And uh, so that's a real interesting idea. But your question was over the past 18 months. Um, I don't I don't know that I've seen a drastic shift in 18 months. There just hasn't been enough change, right? There is certainly the economic cl climate is a little worse. I mean, it is worse than 18 months ago, but the bootstrap SaaS companies I'm seeing that are solving problems are still doing fine. There's not a huge slowdown. There is slowdown, big enterprise deals, especially for selling to Fortune 1000 or public companies because they're seeing their stocks drop, uh, big startups, Facebook, Google, or whatever. If you're selling a $50,000 deal, $100,000 deal to whatever, Target, Facebook, um, they are doing a lot of hiring freezes as they're doing these, these layoffs. So those things are, are slowing down. In terms of like tiny seed microconf companies, <laughs> You know, December wasn't great, because but it never is. And January, I, back to back to business as usual, mostly. So usually what happens, I mean, the reason, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this with like, the reason I think it's gotten easier over 10 years, 15 years, is there's all these new ways to find people, right? There's Twitter, there's social media in general, LinkedIn, Twitter. There is Captera. There is, um, there's all these marketing approaches that really didn't exist Ten, or weren't very accessible 10 or 15 years ago. These marketplaces, these platforms, like I said, the Salesforce, Heroku, Shopify, like these were nascent or non-existent. Um, and so over the last 18 months, there hasn't been a drastic shift in, in those things, right? It's not like Captera came up in the last 18 months or all these marketplaces. So I think, I think it takes more time for it to be a, a, a big shift and make it easier or harder. I'd say it's about the same. All right, over to you, Kurt. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, having been someone that's, you know, made the investment in the WordPress space, um, several different WordPress SaaS things, uh, most prominently WP Engine. Um, do you feel that there's still a lot of opportunity in the WordPress space or do you think it's just gotten crowded? There is always opportunity. There's always opportunity. It's crowded, but there's opportunity. We've also invested in, let's see, Castos, right? Siri, which was yeah. seriously or is seriously simple podcasting. Uh, Lasso, which is a WordPress uh, plugin, I know a couple others as well. Here's what I would say though: WordPress is a mature. You have to think about a mature space differently than a, a mature platform differently than a one-year-old platform. The opportunities are there, but they're different. So if I were to personally build a WordPress plugin today or want to get into the WordPress ecosystem as specifically with a software product, obviously there's a bunch of ways, there's consulting and there's other things, but specifically with software, the basic ideas, all the basic features are built, right? That's a mature product. The way I would look to get into it is in one of two ways, take some type of new technology ecosystem, whatever, and apply it to WordPress. Two examples, a friend of mine named Phil Dirksen back in 2013-ish built WP Pinnet Pro, I think it was called, or WP Pinnet, which was a Pinterest WordPress plugin. It was like one of the first because Pinterest was new. So if a new, so where's the WP Tech Talk, right? Where's the WP Web3? Where's the WP AI? Where's that, right? These are new-ish things that are becoming prominent. So he built Pinterest one and then he built WP Stripe. 
which I believe he had to rename to WP Simple Pay, maybe because Stripe was, <laughs> you know, I have a trademark and all that. But all that said, those were, and he built it in 2012, 2013, as Stripe came into prominence. So today, if I were to do that, it's like, like I just gave three examples, right? But what are the what are the things? WP VR, if that makes sense. WP drones. W, you know, I'm I'm kind of just brainstorming here, but like, what are all the new technologies that we've seen over the past two years? And are there WordPress plugins? Are the, is there a need? So that's one way to do it. That's risky. You're timing a market, and it may just never come to fruition that that's needed, right? You're kind of taking a gamble. The way I would actually do it, the lower risk way, is there's all these plugins out there. And a bunch of them have either been abandoned or someone just wants to let them go. I would try to adopt or buy personally. And I have multiple friends, literally dozens of friends who have either gone in and acquired a WordPress plugin, like gone through the repo and been like, oh my gosh, this plugin has a kajillion five-star reviews and X amount of downloads. I don't remember what number you can see, but X amount of installs, right? I think it shows. And they'll contact, but no update in two years. And they'll reach out and say, you know, can I acquire this? Can I adopt this? Can I buy it from you? I mean, Craig Hewitt has been, uh, founder of Castos, has been public about seriously simple podcasting, which is his plugin that then became Castos, a, 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 yeah. a, you know, a seven-figure SaaS app. He was contacted by the person who owned that, and he acquired it for single-digit thousands, right? He hasn't been exact, but I mean, single-digit thousands. We're talking between one and $9,000, and that became a business. So that would be, that's where I would go. We could go down that, that rabbit hole a lot further, but that's where I think those are the easy opportunities in WordPress or yeah. any mature space. Yeah. And I like that you hit on the luck thing because, you know, your book that you have available on your site talks about, you know, there's no such thing as luck marketing as soon as you start coding and all that. And it's like, sometimes you get lucky, but you can't bank on it, right? One, right. one in 10,000 chance of being lucky or something like that, you said. Yep. Awesome. Yep. But, Hard work, luck, yeah. and skill are the things that I see that people who are successful, there's a combination of hard work, of luck, and of skill. You can't, you can't change, you can't impact luck, but you can impact the other two. You can build your skills, you can build your experience, and of course you can work hard. Yeah, I appreciate that. Jonathan? Yeah, just a quick follow-up question. One of the things um, I've been thinking about this, Rob, because um, obviously um, what makes word is a bit the same with individuals, it's the same with companies, and it's the same with platforms. What the strengths of WordPress are also its weaknesses. Um, I, it's a much more open platform than a SaaS like WooCommerce compared. Let's take WooCommerce to Shopify. You know, um, Shopify, easier probably to get up and running. WooCommerce, ownership, flexibility. Um, if you're building an add on service, you'd probably be more advised to look at WooCommerce because Shopify could at any time just say, we're taking that on over or we don't like it. Platform um, risk. But um, the main problem with WordPress is it's a bit of a flea market. You know, you've got these 60,000 plugins and that. And WordPress and Automatic, for understandable reasons, don't want because they would be a sitting target if they really started recommending stuff. But that's where I see AI being, because I see one of the opportunities in WordPress, and you see that with the leading influencers in the WordPress space on YouTube, podcasting, is they become human curators, recommendators. I see AI helping people with integration about being able to look at all these choices and customizing the solution for somebody. Do you think I'm on the right path? So are you saying that we'll go to AI to help us pick like what's the best WordPress plugin to do X, Y, Z? Yeah, we've got, we got a business, you know, we, we're wanting to get a membership website up and we've got these specific things and we'll be able to put it in interface and it would just give us this is this is the recommendation list of plugin solutions for mm. you to achieve what you're looking to do. Sure. I think that's totally reasonable. I think for AI to get there, it needs to start citing sources because right now it can it makes stuff up. And when I go to Google and I type a a search, I was looking for like 
what was I looking for? Oh, it was a steamer. You know what a hand steamer is where you can steam clothes? It's I've, got, like an I've iron got one. Metal. I've got yeah. one, bro. They're great. Uh, we didn't have one. We were on a trip and we, the hotel had one where I'm like, well, how do I not own this? Right? This is amazing. So I went to chat GPT and I said, what's the best steamer that I should buy? Here are my requirements. And then I went to Google and I did the same thing. I went with Google's recommendation because mm -hmm. in Google, there were 10 links. And guess what? One of them was like the wire cutter or something that I trust. So if I knew that the moment, and actually the top two in Google were like these BS SEO sites, you know, best dash steamer dash in dash that, right? It's like, so I skipped those. I went to the wire cutter. So I was seeking the source that I trusted. Then I looked at it and I was like, cool, right there. Boom, bought it. Chat GPT, I looked at it and I'm like, I don't, is it? Is it making this up? Like it just fell. I, I couldn't trust it yet. But if Chat GPT had said, based on recommend, based on amal you know amalgamating the wire cutter and CNET and Consumer Reports or whatever, this is the one we recommend. Blah blah blah. I would have felt much more confident. So in terms of your question of which you know plugins should I use to do a this that ecom you know WordPress site with these requirements, if it recommended something to be today, I'd be like. I need to double check all this with Jonathan because I don't know WordPress well enough. But if it cited sources of this is from the WP Tonic blog and we aggregated this and that, that would make me personally feel much more comfortable with the recommendations. Yeah, just um, to wrap up the podcast, you okay to stay on for a little longer? Oh, yeah. Bonus, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I've got such mixed feelings about AI because um, it's definitely a disruptor and it definitely is real. But it also, these people that say it's intelligent, or it, it's really got elements of the, do you know this um, thing that happened in the 18th century, the Mechanical Turk, mm -hmm. um, where there, it was a chess mach playing machine, but it was somebody in the bottom of the box. It, it, it's that, because it's a bit like Alan Turling. It, passed, it, it probably will help pass the Alan Turling test. And then... Um, but it's not intelligent. It's not intelligent. It's just, it has no intelligence at all. It, it's ridiculous that people even think that. But I'm amazed at the amount of people that even suggest that. They really show that they know nothing about the subject. And I literally know nothing about it. But um, it's really, it's not surprised you. I suppose not really. I, was... I like anything, AI has been batted around for a decade, right? Or more, I mean, for 50, 100 years, whatever, since Mechanical Turk. But really in computing, people have been saying, oh, this thing is AI in, a, a, you know, if, if it helps you generate a few subject lines in a email marketing software. And it wasn't actually AI. It was a bunch of if then else statements or a bunch of case statements, right? And so AI has been misused. And anyone who's a developer or who's technical knows a lot of the stuff people have called AI is not. Um, so no, it doesn't surprise me that there are folks who think it's actually intelligent. But I will say that while it, while you and I know it's not actually intelligent, that it's just absorbing a bunch of information and learning to spit it out in a new way, it is allowing us to do things that you could never do before, right? Yeah. It's People are literally taking songs, like a Beatles song, yeah. and the AI can pull out a single track in a way that we you just couldn't do it. Or it can record, you can upload a five-minute sample of your voice i think it's 11 11 labs is what it's called you upload it and then you can just type stuff and it will say it as you like that's pretty incredible you know and the ability to um i actually want it i mean i go to chat gpt like i said and i have it outline you know a youtube video and then i'll take pieces of it i actually want to i'm trying to figure I, i'm working on this now with a, with a friend but i'm trying to upload all of my everything i've ever done like my books I'm working on my fourth book. It's almost done. I am. I have all these YouTube videos I've recorded that are just me. I have all these podcast episodes that are just me. I have more than 100 essays on my blog. But like, I want to stuff all that into an AI. And then when it comes up for YouTube, say, how would, how would I outline this? Because it's going to know now. It's going to borrow from my previous stuff, right? So that's like incredible power. So it's not intelligent, but it's... It is a step. It is yeah. a step above anything that we have in yeah. terms of you know the ability to to produce. Uh, I don't know. It's a very. Output. I kind of see it as a very powerful, sophisticated tool. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Right. And it's like anything, everything. Right. So Web three and crypto and NFTs, hype, hype, hype. But but that's actually good technology that has uses. Those things have 
you know, actual uses. I think of the internet in the 90s, iPipeHype.com crash, but then look, it sticks around. You know, everything has this hype cycle, VR and AR. Um, so AI is a little, probably like anything, is a little overhyped right now because it's new, but it will settle in and it will become something that we use day to day. All right, we're going to close the podcast part of the show. Uh, Rob's agreed to stay on um, for a couple more questions and a bit more discussion. Um, you'll be able to watch the whole interview um, on the WP Tonic YouTube channel. Please go over there. I've got a ton of content and discussion. We had a great roundtable show last week. Um, we had um, the founder of WP Engine um, join us, Jason. Um, it was a great discussion. Um, so, um, so Rob, maybe um, tell people how they can find more about about you and your thoughts. But also, can you give us a quick outline of what your new book's going to be about? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, if you know, you obviously listen to a podcast or watching YouTube right now to hear this. I have a podcast called Startup for the Rest of Us. It's up to 650 episodes, been shipping every week since 2010, and it's about bootstrapping and SaaS, and it's the longest running, I think, and the most kind of the most prominent um, in that space. And then uh, YouTube, microconf.com slash YouTube, I also spit out a, a new YouTube video on that kind of stuff every week that's different from the podcast. The book is called The SaaS Playbook, Build a Multi-Million Dollar, multi -million dollar Startup Without Venture Capital. And so it's about bootstrapping, but also mostly bootstrapping. There's a lot of companies in my orbit that raise a couple of hundred grand. It's not venture money, but it's enough to get them that, you know, to escape velocity. And so uh, I'm going to be doing a Kickstarter for the book in a couple of months. And I cover, it's it's just a super compact, my books are all 200 pages. You know, it's like you can read it on an airplane flight, but I cover, you know, market, like how to build a product people want and are willing to pay for. I talk about team. If you decide to build one, how to hire, when to hire. Uh, talk about SaaS metrics that you should know, 80-20 SaaS metrics, I call it, pricing structures, marketing approaches, how to find the one that works, or the one or two or three that work for you, and then uh, entrepreneurial mindset, right? All the, the biggest mistakes that I see folks making as well as how to how to do it for the long term. So all that in like six chapters, 200 pages, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. I haven't written, this is my first book in like five years. It's my fourth book that I've written, but it's the first one since the Entrepreneur's Guide to keeping your shit together, which I wrote with my wife, and uh, really, really excited about it. Yeah, it sounds great. I'll, I'll buy a copy. There you Thank go. You. Um, yeah. Kirk, Kirk, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? Uh, well, I'm lucky in that I have a unique name. I'm the only Kurt Von Onen you'll find on LinkedIn, and I'm on LinkedIn almost every day. So if you can jump on LinkedIn, make a connection, uh, chances are we'll end up on a ice breaking phone call and figure out how we can add value to each other, which I love, love, love to do. I love meeting people. Also, anything that is Manana Nomas online is typically mine. So uh, look up Manana Nomas and there I'll be. That's great. It's, um, it's been a great discussion. We've got some fantastic guests of the quality of Rob coming up in the next couple of months. I'm really excited. A very diverse group of people but all about tech, SaaS, WordPress. It's all big stuff, isn't it, listeners and viewers? In a interesting witch's brew. We will be back next week with another great discussion. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. So on to the bonus content. Um, so if you had um, a time machine and you could go back to your early days, um, is there anything that comes to your mind that you would love to be able to tell yourself that would have made the journey a, a bit less stressful? Anything that comes to mind, Rob? I would have told myself stress less about things that aren't going to matter because I stress way too much about it. And I really wish the, the journey, I feel like I am, I've had the success that I wanted, but part of the journey was really rough because I just couldn't get over myself, you know, couldn't get over the mental hurdles. The other thing I would say is when I first started out, I, I had worked these jobs where I didn't like my coworkers, oftentimes didn't like, you know, I was just like, I really cared about the work and other people didn't. And that was very tough. So when I quit and I was doing my own products, I was like, I'm going to do all this on my own because I don't like working with other people. So I tried that and I don't need advice and I don't need mentorship and I'm not going to ask anybody. I'm going to figure it out all on my own. And it took me years because of that, like big mistake, right? By the time I got, I started looking up to folks like Jason Cohen, you're talking about, Heat and Shaw, uh, 
you know, pe people speaking at microconf, as well as I got in two different mastermind groups that like changed the trajectory. And I started hiring teams. I was doing everything solo before I'd hire a few contractors, but I wanted to be that solopreneur, like four hour work week person. And it just capped my, it capped my growth and it made me go a lot slower than I would have, uh, had I involved other people in all aspects of it. By the time we got to drip and I hired a team of 10, like we were moving fast and it's cause I got over myself and basically said, let other people help with the work. That's great. Over to you, Kurt. So uh, having written your own books and having your own very successful podcast, I, I, I hesitate with the question, but are there any books, websites, or online resources that have helped you uh, in your business development, things that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, there are a lot. I have, I believe it's it's right around 900 audiobooks in my Audible account. That's how many, but yeah. And because I, I am a constant, constant learner. And so there have been many, many that have helped me over the years. It, it obviously depends on the topic, but like two, I'll just say the two most recent that I think have had an impact on me were, there's a book called Founding Sales by Pete Kazanji. I just had him on my podcast. Mm -hmm. It is a really good book. It's, it's like almost 600 pages, but it's more of a reference. You don't read it straight through. He covers everything from like, you're a founder learning how to sell a product. What do you do? That's chapter one. By the end, it's like how to scale your sales team at a startup and hire managers who manage salespeople. Like it's the full life cycle. I mean, it will take you from, I don't know how to build a you know, a deck to sell this SaaS or this WordPress plugin that I built all the way to doing everything. So that's where I've looked at it. And I was like, this is quite possibly the best book I've read about being a founder and learning to sell your product. And he, the reason is, is because he was not a salesperson and he became a founder and had to learn it. And he just chronicled all that. So really good book on sales. The other one is by Dan Martell. It's a brand new book called Buy Back Your Time. And I have read so many productivity time management books, read the four hour work week. And it, and it was, it was good at the time, you know, this, I, and I figured there would be a rehash of that. And it was not like Dan Martell brought his best effort. And it is a very good book about learning how to delegate, learning how to hire. It starts with like hiring VAs and then um, hiring up the chain and, and getting rid of more and more tasks. And it's not just theory. It is a bunch of super tactical stuff. Like literally he has, a, I think he has a screenshot at one point of like, these are the labels that my EA, my executive assistant uses. This is our whole system, exactly how she goes through my inbox, she categorizes these and I do this. And I mean, it's, it's the workflow. Like that's one of his chapters. So yeah. I love stuff like that, that gets deep in the weeds. Those are two very different books, but they are ones that have had, you know, had an impact on me over the past couple months. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a Dan Martell thing. I really enjoyed them. Um, one thing I really got from your pod, recent podcast, and I think probably over a six month period, you stressed a couple of times, and I'm working on it now because I'm working out a kind of business to business strategy outreach. Um, is this painkiller vitamin um, that you stress that you know that is? best if you're bootstrapped, if you've got a pain-killing solution. You can still be successful with the vitamin, but um, it's going to be easier on the pain-killing. I've kind of really focused on that. Um, do you kind of, would you like to give a quick outline of that? I know I'm asking you to repeat, but I think it's something really useful for people to really understand. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a vitamin versus a painkiller, right? Or a vitamin versus aspirin, you might hear people say. But um, if you build a vitamin product, a good example of a vitamin product, vitamins are nice to have. We should take them. A lot of us forget or we don't. And a vitamin SaaS product might be like, it's a marketing dashboard to check up on my marketing metrics. It yeah. might be something to, oh, I was thinking, um, it's a tool to make our, to make our documentation read more clearly. So, or it's an SEO tool that suggests keywords you should write about. I actually had one of these and it's like, these are all, these are all cool, but I don't need, need, need them. A painkiller is I need to process payments 
what, what do I, I need PayPal, I need Stripe, like I need something. I have to do this to start my business. I, if I'm gonna sell e-commerce stuff, I have to have a shopping cart. <laughs> that is a painkiller. If I uh, am gonna start posting to social media, I need something to create these images, create video, right? It's like you go to Google and search for it. That's the, and it's a desperate need and people are, more, are if you do those actions, you have to um, you know, have that tool and that's where the painkiller comes in. Yeah, because, um, yeah, I think um, I've really focused on that. I think it's been useful for me. All right, Rob, I know you've got, you've got to go back, write your book or whatever, <laughs> with your AI assistant. <laughs> uh, um, we're going to wrap it up, Rob. Hopefully you'll come back later on the year. I always enjoy our discussions. I think we've covered a lot in this interview. It's been, um, but we kept it on track, didn't we? Uh, um, so... We're going to wrap it up now, folks. We'll be back next week with another super interview. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye.